Yo, 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 what is up? It is your boy JT. Today we are in another Bible study. We're doing our first Bible study on James 1 today. Now, if you know anything about James, it's a pretty deep book, and we're going to be doing it over 1 through 16. So before we get started, let's go ahead and talk about, um, like, the roughly, the rough background info on James. Here's what it said. Now, when does James occur? It said there's no information in James, but the letters to suggest a specific date. Scholars the people who actually studied the Bible, right? Uh, they presume the writing took place between AD 48 and 52, 10 or more years before James' death in AD 62 or AD 66. Now James, the brother of Jesus, is most likely the one who wrote this, uh, this book. There's a bunch of other James listed, but James, the brother of Jesus, most likely wrote this book. Though he was not a follower of Christ during Christ's earthly ministry, a post-resurrection appearance convinced James that Jesus was indeed Christ. Ugh. He was later led to the Jerusalem church and exercised great influence there. So he's very close to this Jerusalem church. Now the message and purpose as a general epistle, right? There's different epistles according to who wrote the books of the Bible. Uh, James was written with a broad audience rather than a specific group of people. He focuses on themes of wisdom, faith, moral, ethical conduct. He highlights wisdom as valuable for proper speech and worship for determining who ought to teach, and for avoiding internal conflicts within congregations. He presents the importance of faith in action, stating that faith, it's, uh, which does not itself, which, what does it say? Does not itself express good works is useless. The epistle also deals with ethics and social justice. So, we're going to go ahead and get into, we're going to start into James. Now, the way this chapter is set up, um, the James, the very first chapter Jane is set up, it is, frankly, it's just 1 through 12 are trials, and then, um, you know, 1, 13 through 15 deal with temptations, and then, you know, 1 through 2 are your greetings. It says here, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus, to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad, greetings. Trials and maturity. Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces an endurance, and endurance um, have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting, for the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways now normally we would read the whole passage but today we're only going to be reading uh, we're going to take a definitely small chunk because there's a lot of deep um like theology and like characters of god that i want to illuminate so number one um it's i was reading somewhere and actually james the person who wrote this book had calluses on his knee it was because he had such a devotion to prayer that he actually was on his knees all the time if you don't know um during biblical times people would pray on their knees he would pray on his knees so often that he actually had thick calluses. Like that means like when it's the uh, same thing that happens nowadays when you lift a weight or a bar that's too heavy, you'll get calluses right here on your hands. Um, and they take forever to go away. And it shows that, uh, you know, the heavier, the more calluses you get, the more likely and more heavier the weight you've been carrying. And, but James had them on his knees. So they were visible and on his knees and they were very, very thick. And so in the beginning of chapter one in verses one, he says, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. Now, we don't know exactly what these 12 tribes are referring to. Contrary to popular belief, it's not referring only to all the 12 tribes of, um, of Israel. It could also be referring to maybe, uh, you know, Israel as a whole, right? Those tribes. It could also, also, whoo, whoo, my goodness, sorry guys, still waking up, still waking up. Um, or, but it could also mean all Jews, people of Jewish faith, right? There were Jews who didn't live in Israel that were also, quote unquote, part of the uh, part of the tribe. So we don't know. We really don't know what it was that were these 12 tribes. But we do know um, that this purpose and the purpose of this book and the message, as we discussed, was written to all the Jews. It means to a huge audience, which means a lot of the info that we can take from here can it directly apply to our lives with scripture. Oftentimes, we take the scripture out of context, even though the scripture was meant for a certain person or group of people. But this one was meant to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. And so, since we don't know who that is, we can actually assume that this is meant for us. And it's also a general epistle as well, which is really cool. Really cool. 
Now for the meat of this passage, okay? He talks about here trials and maturities in verses 2 through 7. Now we're going to take it line by line, and there's a lot of good stuff in this, like a lot of good meat. So if you guys haven't, you know, get it ready for highlight, just getting, just get ready to highlight, okay? He says, Consider it a great joy, brothers and sisters, when you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. <sighs> in case you guys don't know, I woke up uh, two minutes before I started this uh, video. And he says, And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, there's a bunch of really good stuff to come out of this. Number one, okay, your faith is not produced, guys. Okay, your faith is not, um, your faith is tested, not produced. And that's a really key takeaway, because if you're like me, you were taught growing up that, like, man, you know, the more, the more hard stuff you go through in life, the more your faith, um, is produced. But in reality, no, no, no. <laughs> no, faith is, uh, tested. Okay, faith is tested. It's not produced. It literally says here, um, Whenever you experience various trials, because let know that the testing of your faith, right? The testing of your faith produces endurance. It's not that your trials produce endurance um, or your trials produce your faith. No, your faith and your uh, trial go hand in hand to produce a certain outcome. And the outcome is to test your faith and to increase it. You can have the faith of, of, like, of like a penny, okay? But if you constantly put that penny through a wash or you constantly scrub the penny to make it shinier, you know what's going to happen? Eventually, the more times you shine it, the more shinier and new that penny's going to be looking. And the more stronger it probably will be because of all the rust. The same thing, the same thing is with our hearts, right? The more you go through a test, the more you go through a trial, it's not that your faith is getting any more or less. Your faith isn't tied to your circumstances, but instead, the strength of your faith and the production of patience that comes afterward is what does produce a lot of fruit. And so here, um, there's a couple good things here again. See, you, uh, your trials are opportunities to receive wisdom. It starts in verses 5 and 7 talking about wisdom. But another key thing here is the command that it says to have um, joy during your trials. So often we see our trials and we're like, man, like God is not doing it for me. Like, man, I thought God was looking out for me, but this happened. Or like maybe, you know, God called me to work at this job, yet... All of a sudden, my car doesn't work on the very first day. Or there could be a million reasons. A million reasons why God doesn't provide for you. However, despite no matter what you're called to do, you're supposed to be happy. You're supposed to be joyful. And there's a difference between being happy and joyful, okay? Happiness is a temporary emotion. You get happy, you know, um, if you're like me, you get happy when mushroom doesn't bother you during that Bible studies. But you're joyful that, that your cat is around in general. Or maybe you're happy that you have a car, um, but you're joyful that it gets you to and from a place. Or a good example is you're happy that you received a gift, but you're joyful when you get happiness that you don't have to receive one. So happiness and joy, they're two different things. They're totally different types of emotions, but we want to be cultivating a, um, we want to be cultivating joy. If we're not cultivating joy, we're not cultivating probably one of the better emotions. In fact, I'm pretty sure uh, love and a lot of the fruits of the Spirit directly come from this attitude of joy. Um, and then it says, let your endurance have full effects that you're, you may mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now, endurance, okay? In my book, it says endurance, but in most other translations, it's going to use the word patience. So I'm really substituting this word patience, right? So it says here, let your patience have its full effects that you may be mature and complete, right? So as you go through these trials and you develop patience, right? You begin to become more mature. You become to get more complete and you start to lack nothing because patience is directly tied to your maturity. For example, how, how often were you when you were like a little two-year-old kid and your mother didn't get you something that you wanted to get and you'd be like, I want it done now. Like, no, I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait. I want to get it done now, right? And if you're like me, uh, impatience is almost part of your vocabulary. Like I'm a very impatient person, very, very impatient person. And I'm very hard on myself because I'm impatient. Um, and so here, right here, um, your, your endurance, your patience is directly product to the amount of faith that you've gone through and the amount of trials you've gone through. It's not related to the amount of faith you have, but how much trials you have gone through. Um, and going down to verse five, 
It says, Now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given. All right, so it says, specifically people who lack wisdom. Now, what is wisdom? There are two different types of wisdom. Okay, there's knowledge and there's wisdom. Okay, knowledge is raw info about something. So, for example, I see this tree is green. I see this tree is green. But wisdom is how to, is the application of the knowledge. So, I'll give you a perfect example. Give you a perfect example. Last night, um, I took a bath. I bathed, okay? I, um, I, I, mushroom. Don't you dare start, buddy. You've already been in all knowing. Uh, so yesterday, I took a bath. I bathed, okay? Um, and I got these flowers from work. Now, these flowers turn the water blue, okay? So, knowledge was, okay, the, these flowers, when hit water, they function as blue dyes. What ancient people would use as blue dye. They're called butterfly pea flowers. So the knowledge was that, okay, wow, these flowers can turn things blue. But the application of it was, all right, let me put it in water and make my bath water blue. I know it sounds like I'm literally two years old, but it's true. Um, and so I put it in the water and it turns out that, wow, it was acting blue and my whole bath water turned like a dark blue. See the application, application of the knowledge that this flower was blue made it me acting on the wisdom but um just knowing that the uh flower itself turns things blue is only knowledge and so that's an example of wisdom and knowledge right knowledge is the raw info and wisdom is the application of it and so when i read verse five and this may be a little controversial for some of you guys okay um if you guys know i'm not opposed to the law of attraction at all i'm not opposed to the law of attraction manifestation um i'm not opposed to that and when i read this um, especially verses, you know, five through uh, six and six as well. I'm reminded like this is essentially the principle of law of attraction. And I'll read it again so you guys can maybe get a better picture. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly. It will be given to him, but let him ask in faith without doubting for the doubter is like a surging sea drive driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything for the Lord being double-minded and unstable in all his ways literally it's saying here if you ask for something and you believe you'll get it okay you believe you'll get it you will receive it now if that doesn't sound like you know manifestation or law of attraction um i don't know what it is some of you don't know what law of attraction is or manifestation right it's the idea that um you can almost will things into existence that like you can almost speak it into existence right it's like you consciously think that man i'm gonna make a hundred dollars today and you firmly believe in your heart you do it and then it comes true Okay, prayer is a form of manifestation. I've said this many times, but prayer is a form of manifestation and it's also a form of law of attraction. Except, uh, instead of believing in ourselves to answer the prayer, we believe that God will provide us with the answer and will provide us with what we need in the situations. And so, a um, couple characteristics of when God gives and when God speaks to us. It says here he gives two things. He gives to us generously and ungrudgingly, which means that he gives a lot. He gives a, a lot no matter who you are. And then number two, number two, he is um, ungrudgingly when he does it. So he is also um, indiscriminate. He doesn't care what you do. He wants to give to you, wants to give to you no matter what. So, uh, and he says, if you if you ask him, who, the God who's going to give you anything you want, regardless of who you are, it will be given to him. And then he says another, a follow-up command, but let him ask in faith without doubting. For the doubter is like the surging sea driven and tossed by the wind, right? So he's saying this doubting person is like a sea that's tossed by the wind, um, right? The wind makes a wave, okay? So basically it's like a wave is going up and down, up and down, up and down. It's going a million and one places. And that's the purpose of the wind. But in reality, right, in reality, um, you know, a doubter is just like that. They're going from left to right to up to down to all forms, just like the wind being surging sea, right? He just moves it everywhere with no discriminate purpose. And so if you guys are highlighting with me, I highlighted verse five in pink and I highlighted verse six in orange, six in orange. Um, yeah. And so basically he's really saying, literally just come and ask. If you want something, come and ask. It's not a foreign idea that God will give to you no matter what you want. Um, it's pretty common, actually. In fact, everybody in the Old Testament and uh, 
people in biblical times when the New Testament was written believe that God would answer your prayers if you simply believed he would answer your prayers. It's not a very complicated subject to talk about. Then he says that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all of his ways. Now, verse 9, uh, 9 and 10, I highlighted in green, if you guys are highlighting with me. Um, it says, let the brother of humble circumstances boast in his exaltation. Ooh, that was a big word. Exaltation, but the, let, let the rich boast in his humiliation, because he will pass away like a flower of a field. For the sun rises, and together with the scorching wind, dries up the grass. Its flowers fall off, and its beautiful appearance perishes. In the same way, the rich person will wither away while pursuing his activity so okay it's giving two commands here it's giving two two ways that we should be praising god okay we should be praising god when a, you know a humble brother or a person who's poor boasts in his exaltation but then we should also be uh the rich um you know boast in his humiliation and if he does that he will pass away like a flower now this idea of a flower is a really nice and kind of a cool metaphor if you know anything about me i love nature and so I love it, and I can appreciate the metaphor here. So really, um, what he's saying is your trials relate to your wisdom, and your uh, riches relate to humility. So um, that's essentially the meaning of verses 9 to 10. We should be exalting God no matter what, as long as the outcome is positive, and even negative. Um, it doesn't matter what you're going through, what your circumstance is. We should be praising God afterward, knowing that, man, he's good, he's glorious, and at the very end of every trial... There's a, you know, a brighter picture and something brighter to get behind. And so, um, right, he's boasting. He's calling us to boast, but it's like a flower. Specifically, a rich person's like a flower. Now, what does he mean? Well, right, so the sun rises and it says, together with the scorching wind, it dries up the grass. So, because of, uh, the grass falls off, that means the flower no longer is getting its nutrients to live. It's kind of like the same thing of a parable of a sower, right? He threw, he threw the seed and it hit one of four plots. One of the plots that landed on was a rock. And the rock, uh, the seed was able to sprout on the rock. But as soon as the sun came up, that seed was scorched. And that, uh, that quote-unquote flower was no more. It's the same way here, guys. It's the same way here. Okay, except uh, this flower represents the material possessions of the world. And um, so the, if, if this person is consistently pursuing things in this world that are negative, that are materialistic, that are not God glorifying and not God deserving, right? He's going to wither away. It's, a, it's actually a promise here. He says, will wither away while pursuing his activities. And that is, act Whoa. that is actually a promise from God that you will wither away. And it's a reminder to me that it's not about my physical possessions in this world. Like it's not. There's a whole lot more in this world than physical possessions. But I constantly think differently. Verse 12 says, Blessed is the one who endures trials because he has stood the test and will receive the crown of life uh, that God has promised to those who love him. No one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God, since God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he draws uh, and is enticed by his own evil desire. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. When sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. So, Verse 12 is a promise. So highlight that in purple, or not purple, pink. We highlight it in pink for promises. It means, right, um, you, if you endure, endure trial, you're blessed. You're blessed when you endure the trial. And you endure the trial by having what it says up above in verse 5 with patience. You endure a trial through patience. So he says, blessed is the one who endures the trial, quote unquote, in, through patience, because he has stood the test and he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to him. Now, it's giving, it's a threefold thing here. It's giving the trial, the quote-unquote trial, right? The cause, the outcome, and then the motive for doing it. So here he's saying, verse 12, the one who endures the trial, right? He's talking about the trial itself. So he's giving what he's going through. Trial can be referred to um, in a million of different things. So we'll just assume here, maybe you're impatient, right? Blessed is the one who endures impatience. Because when you stood the test, of, uh, the test, he will receive the crown of life of God. That is the outcome. So if you endure with patience, this is the outcome. And then he says that God has promised to those who love him. So the motive for wanting to, you know, endure this trial is because you love God. You love God so much that you want to um, agree with him and you want to get close to him. Um, the motive is you love God. That's why he says that for, he has promised to those who love him. He's not saying to 
uh, him he loves, he's saying no to those who love him. Which means that when we go through trials, we should be going through with the posture and a heart posture of love. Because when you go through a heart posture of love, it makes the trial a whole lot easier. In fact, love is also one of the fruits of the Spirit as well. In Galatians, I think, 5. Verse 13, I also highlighted in um, blue because it's a big character of God. Now, I could do a whole Bible study just on this, just on this, but I'm not going to, okay? It says, no one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God since God is not tempted and he himself does not tempt. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Guys, he's literally saying so many times I've asked myself, why does God tempt people? Or like, what's the purpose of God tempting people? And Lily says very clearly here, God is not tempted by evil and he does not tempt him. Him, uh, he does not tempt anyone. And here's why. Temptation would go against God's character and would go against one of God's promises that he will never forsake you. Instead, he allows the temptations of other people. In this world, he allows the temptation of Satan. Um, so Satan, he wants to tell us that like the pursuit of evil is good. That's really the root of temptation, that uh, evil is good. That's the purpose of temptation. Satan wants you to fall into evil thinking that it's good. Um, remember, Satan wants to uh, come, kill, and destroy. I believe, or seek, kill, and destroy. Those are Satan's three goals. So here, whenever you're going under, undergoing a trial, he gives the command saying, no, this temptation doesn't come from God. Like, no, God doesn't tempt by evil and he doesn't tempt anybody. How many times have we been in a situation where we're like, man, man, oh man. Um, <laughs> that temptation, why would God tempt me like that? Why would God put that in my path? But then we remind ourselves like, wait, God didn't put that in our path, right? Like that didn't come from God. God, if it's not of love, if not of uh, love or one of the fruits of the spirit, it didn't come from God. It didn't come from God. Instead, we have to remind ourselves that it comes from the enemy. And once we realize that these thoughts come from the enemy, we can deal with them as uh, like someone in the military would. We would, uh, we would go after the enemy. We would illuminate the lie. I talked so much on this, on our Bible studies about illuminating the lie when it comes to temptation. And there is always a lie. It may be hard to find, but there's always a lie. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Everybody would. So then he said, he gives how we're tempted, actually. So he says, it's not God who tempts you. He says, instead, each person is tempted when he's drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then after that uh, desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. When sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Now, specifically in verse 14, it talks about being drawn away and enticed by your own desire. A lot of times, uh, we give Satan too much credit for these sins. We live in a fallen world with a bunch of evil people, billions of evil people, and we wonder why things go bad, okay? It's not all because of Satan. Satan isn't the reason why every bad thing in this world happens. We are also the reason why bad things happen because we live in a fallen world, a world that is negative and a world that is far from God. We have a sinful, evil nature because of Adam and Eve. And so here, we give people, we give Satan way too much credit, way too much credit for sins. Um, I don't think Satan is going around to every billions of person and saying, I'm going to tempt you with this, Jay, you with this. I don't think Satan can do that. I don't think he has the brain power to do that. But I do think um, that he's done such a good job in this world that he's allowed evil to exist and foster in this world. And the only way to fight evil is by illuminating the darkness and fighting it with good. And the, which is why um, I try to do at least an act of kindness every single day, every single day. But we keep we keep giving Satan so much um, like credit for what temptation, but in reality, we're the ones doing it. I don't think, you know, for example, I struggled with pornography and lust a whole lot growing up. And so I would be like, Satan, why were you putting, you know, um, these images in front of me? But then I looked down and I'd be the one Googling these images. Satan wasn't forcing me to Google these images. He wasn't tempting me to do it. No, I wanted to do it out of my own evil desire. And we have evil desires because we are born naturally evil because of the first sin of Adam. And then verse 15 says, Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Now, he, now <clears throat> here's the train. It goes from desire to sin, from sin to death. I'll say it again. Desire to sin, to sin, to death. Okay, so you have your desire. You have your desire, then your desire leads you to your sin, and then your sin leads you to your death. When you have your desire that leads to sin, it's when you're enticed by, we're actually doing a Bible study on this now, but the three types of temptations, 
um, they're mentioned a couple times throughout scripture. Um, it's the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and uh, the pride of life. These are like the core sins. They can be summed up in glory, um, glory, gold, or girls. Glory, gold, or girls. It's kind of like the an acronym for it. And so, once those desires, once you acknowledge that you want those desires, and you conceive and you embody those desires, and you begin to chase after those desires, then it says you're giving birth to sin. And then, when that sin is getting into your life, right, uh, and when it's fully grown, it gives birth to death. Now, it doesn't say here that sin it immediately makes you dead. It doesn't say that. It says it gives birth to sin, and then when the sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death, which means... When, it, when If you let your sin get out of hand and don't get it under control, it will lead to death. And I do believe that you can lose your salvation from God if you're not careful. And here, right, he literally says it gives birth to sin. When sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Well, what is death? It's not a physical death. It's talking again about a spiritual death. And once you're spiritually dead, you're actually born away from God. Then you have to get resaved and rededicated. That's why you see a lot of people come back to the faith because they feel as though they lost their salvation from God. It's the same way with this idea of sinning. Um, and that's a very controversial topic, by the way. Very controversial. Not everybody agrees that you can lose your salvation. Um, but I do. And lastly, in verse 16, 17, and 18, it talks about uh, kind of deception, right? And so I highlighted verse 16 in green. In green, because it says, Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Um, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting of shadows. Woo. By his own choice, he gave birth to us by the word of truth so that we would be a, a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So he's saying here, despite all this temptation, despite all these trials, despite all of being Im immature in the faith, right? Do not, do not be deceived. That Satan's goal is to deceive you. I say it all the time, but temptation the goal of it is to remind you of what you gain, but blind you to what you hope to lose. Satan wants you to sin. He wants you to give up, and he wants you to be away from God. That is his goal. Instead, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Um, 17, it says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father, who does not change. <sighs> like shifting shadows. Okay, so... He's saying here, everything good in this world comes from God. Now, I, I was talking with a friend last night about this question of why do bad things happen to good people and why do good things happen to bad people? And my response to that is, well, if I'm referring to the, you know, the good person. What do you define as a good person? Because as far as I know, there's only been one good person on this earth, and that is Jesus. And so if a good person is giving something to you and they're incapable of never doing evil, then what they give to you must therefore be good or else they wouldn't be a good person so here he's saying every good and perfect gift is from above so since it comes from above it's a perfect and good gift now the gift isn't just a spiritual gift like wisdom or knowledge but you know what it also could be it could also be something as simple as a little extra money in your finances this month it could also be maybe um god provides for you maybe an old friend reaches out for you it's a gift when good things happen in your life and it comes from god he says it comes down from the Father of Lights, which, by the way, is one of the only references in the Bible I've heard of him referencing to, you know, the God of Lights. So I'm actually going to highlight that from the Father of Lights. I'm going to highlight that. Or not highlight that, underline that. Then he says, who does not change like these shifting shadows, right? The, our God is the Father of Light, which means he's not going to change according to a shadow. If you know what a shadow is, you know that, you know. As the sun goes up throughout the day and rises, the location of the shadow differentiates, differentiates. Um, and it goes across and it does, uh, points a different direction. In fact, old times, in the old days, they would just put a stick on the ground and then they would let the, uh, the shadow <clears throat> streak out somewhere. And wherever the streak would be the time of the day, right? They would use their shadows for good. In the same way here, right? God doesn't have a shadow. Um, and it's also... Also here with this idea of shadow, um, a lot of occult practices teach about what's called a shadow self, which is the, um, in the Christian faith, it would be very similar to the lust of the flesh or like the fleshly version of yourself. And they believe that by bringing your fleshly desires to surface and then writing about them and journaling about why they're wrong um, and asking yourself tough questions, you can actually diminish the, the negative or shadow portion of yourself. So here, it's kind of the same philosophy, right? The father of light, 
um, who does not change like a shifting shadow. Now remember, shadow cannot exist in light, guys. Like if there's a, a full 360 degree of light, there will be no ounce of shadow on it. If I were to hold my finger up, okay, now I were to put a light all, all over my hand, there would be no shadow. You know why? Because it's so illuminating light that a shadow cannot persist. A, a shadow is formed when light comes out a different direction and it comes forward. Like even right here, you see how this, and then it's like right here, right here, and then right there, right? Um, that's an example of a shadow. Shadow happens on, on the back side of light. But if you, if you illuminate the back of the light, your whole hand becomes illuminated and you therefore have no shadow. So then 18 says, by choice, he gave birth to us by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits for of his creatures. Guys, I, we never really thought about this in this way. And I came to this realization last night but we are God's seeds. Like we are the, we talk about so much about planting seeds, but we are God's seeds. Like God planted us. God planted all of us seeds and then we are now all growing, right? We are God's essentially, we are God's harvest. And that's why it says by his own choice, he gave birth to us by the word of truth. So by the word of truth, he gave to us, which is the word of truth, guys, is this Bible. This Bible is the word of truth. Um, that's the word of truth. And so by giving us birth, we were actually... Uh, his first fruits of creatures, which means we are the seed that is constantly growing. We are God's harvest, and God is reaping the benefits of it. And he's reaping the benefits by us glorifying him. Um, if you guys like this Bible study on James 1, 1 through 16, go ahead. Uh, make sure to click follow. Um, click subscribe as well. And what, do you, what was your favorite takeaway? There's a lot of good takeaways out of this. Um, I love you guys, and peace out.